Uh, good evening again, everybody, and welcome back to Beyond 313. Conversations uh, with interesting people uh, dealing with broadly 40 and spiritual matters in regard to various topics. Now, we've already had John Waters talk about transhumanism. We have already had Dave Cullen talk about the spiritual consequences of the TV shows like The, the Lord of the Rings or the, the Rings of Power, sorry. And now I have Sarah Jane Mondaini from the Manchester area in England to talk about something that's long fascinated me. And you've seen my videos on the deep town and things like this. I'm very interested in the hauntological nature of, an, of a landscape, of a place, of a suburb, of a street, psychogeography. This has been long an interest of mine. And I've been to Manchester loads of times. And I know the area fairly well, but and I've always been aware that there were certain towns there that had this interesting history regarding notorious and just interesting and strange people through history. But I, and I've actually been asked by a well-known magazine in the past to do an article on, do a video on them, and I didn't really feel comfortable about it because it just I, I didn't want to be an outsider doing going in, but I still was fascinated by the subject. So Sarah is with us tonight. She has a channel called Sarah Mondaini, and she covers 40 and subjects, not only this stuff, but I think she's doing really important work in the field of the ontological landscape west of Manchester. You all know the song by the, the Super Little Children by the Smiths, Over the Moors, Take Me to the Moors. Well, Sarah's videos are the embodiment of that. So, Sarah, welcome. Thanks for coming and joining us. Thank you for having me, yeah. Thank I love you. your channel. I love your videos, and uh, it was really nice meeting at meeting in 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 Preston, and uh, we got on like a house on fire. And I, I want to introduce your channel to people, but also your work. First question: What was it about where you live that first said to yourself, or near where you live, this place is a bit funny? Um. Well, we've we've had two famous serial, well, two lots of famous serial killers. Um, we've had the Moors murderers, um, and I live across the road from their street. And then we had Harold Shipman. Um, one time you think, okay, it can happen, but two times, two two of the most prolific stories. In, in Great Britain, on your doorstep, you start to ask questions. Is this something something going on in the atmosphere around here? Or um, is there some kind of psychic hotspot around here? Or is there some other scientific explanation? Just seems there's a lot of um, strange stuff going around here through to serial killers from the past and strange legends and hauntings and strange lights in the sky. It's quite a hot spot for activity. Before we get to the, the more sort of 40 and stuff, well, this maybe could be 40 and two, for our international audience, could you just explain who Dr. Harold Shipman was and who also, the, the little brief introduction on the Moore's murderers. Uh, yeah, the, the Moore's murderers was Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, and they were uh, notorious during the 1960s for um, snatching children from the local area and um, doing nefarious things to them and then taking them up to the Moors at Saddleworth and uh, burying them there. And then we have Dr. Harold Shipman, who was a local GP. Uh, I think he specialised in geriatrics and he killed... I don't know, mate. To I don't know the exact count. Uh, it was hundreds some, and hundreds of some people. Estimates could be over a thousand women he killed. Right. Yeah. Right. But a minimum was something like three hundred and eighty, I think, is the yeah. low number. An incredible. Yeah, they number. can't get the exact number because he had so many. He um, he was telling the relatives to get the patients that had died in his care cremated. So it's very difficult because a lot of the bodies had been exhumed. Um, and, and those that were cremated, obviously, um, they, they've gone. And he was murdered in prison, wasn't he? He killed himself. Okay. He hung himself. Yeah. So he took all his secrets with him. Um, so a, de a dead man tells no tales kind of thing. That's right, yeah. Go down for Phil, I want to join in. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, there. 
The Moore's murderers, uh, they both died in prison, Ian Bradley and Moira Henley. And I find that a remarkable story, as gruesome and sad as it is, right down to the fact that she was still communicating with him uh, through the, 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 the mainstream media by pretending she wouldn't, she would, she did know where the bodies were, but it was sexually turning him on. There was a, a bizarre a sadomasochistic thing that went on in prison after they were both locked up through the media. And uh, there was always the, the I mean, that's, uh, I, I've heard the tapes of her, of him torturing uh, Leslie Ann Down, the little girl, and she's in the background saying, shut up, you're messing the recording up. And he made two copies of the tape. One, and when he was asked in court, why did you record it twice? Because it was so interesting. And uh, he didn't want to lose it. And these were cities so with dark people that you about as dark as you can get. Now, you always have this thing that there was that, that famous line in the film and in the book Salem's Lot, where the David Saul character said, hey, do, do evil houses attract evil people? Would you say that this area, of the west of Manchester, there's some kind of phenomenon like that there going on? That's my personal opinion, yes, because um, I'm quite sensitive to, to picking up various atmospheres. So um, there's, there's places around here that feel okay, and there's places around here that I, I don't like. I don't like to go around. I don't like to go near. And when people, if, if people say why, I can't explain. They just feel dark. There's dark places around here. Um, so the average person, they probably wouldn't, you wouldn't pick up on it. You know, you just go about your daily business. But for people like ourselves, where, whose nervous system kind of expands outside the societal norm, you tend to pick up feelings. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and just doesn't feel right. I've been in that location myself and, the, the overwhelming of feeling I always get, and in that part of England anyway, is a sense of sadness. There's a yeah. real sense of melancholy, deep, almost toxic melancholy inherent in, the, in those, those landscapes. And I always find it interesting that you have large industrial cities or large industrial towns and literally on their doorstep, you have it in Sheffield as well, wilderness. Literally on the doorstep, it's like you have this this concentration of people that moved, you know, a legacy of the Industrial Revolution of England. And then you have pure wilderness, surprising wilderness. And people don't, and I'll give it, oh, it surprised me how wild some parts of England, especially, you know, in a populated area. I think that contrast has a lot to do with it. Do you feel that way too? Like that this, that that's a, that, that contrast of heavy urban and then wilderness has some kind of psychic effect. Um, I do, and in the area around here, there's very high levels of quartz in the moors and the wilderness that's around. And um, uh, scientists say that you know heavy heavy amounts of quartz like that they have an ionization effect on the atmosphere, and that can create altered states of wow. consciousness in some people. That's the theory in uh, Liverpool and Bold Street that there's so many stories of people finding themselves passing through different time portals and space time and going back in time. And the theory is that when they dug the underground, underground railway into Liverpool, they tunneled through a gigantic quartz seam that, rise, that goes right under Old Street, where it's the epicenter of all the high strangers in Liverpool. So there's definitely something to the quartz thing regarding the shifting of consciousness. There's no doubt about that. I don't think it affects everybody. I mean, most people, they don't even know, can't see past their end of the nose and or don't realise what's going on. Yeah. But um, certain types of people, I think, yes, it could, could have an effect on their psyche and bring something to the forefront. The, sens the more sensitively inclined ones, you know, the Lovecraft called it the far vision that you, you right. see beyond the everyday thing. What's the socioeconomic, uh, can you name some of the towns first where this, a lot of this stuff goes on, the actual towns? Uh, in, in, yeah, uh, we've got Hyde, obviously, um, Hattersley, Ashton, Buckingfield, Glossop, 
at Gorton, which is where uh, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, they lived before they moved to Hattersley. Um, Bellevue, which interestingly enough is an area in Gorton, and Jimmy Savile ran several dance halls there. And I've actually written the name down of one of them. It's uh, the Top Ten Club, which was a really popular dance hall um, in 1962. And everybody went there. It was the place to be. And I'm sure that those two frequented there. And if they did, then there's, they would have introduced themselves, I think, to Jimmy Savile. I don't think there's any way possible that those three could not have known each other in this area at yeah. the time. Yeah, they just would have interacted just by sheer geogra- geography. Yeah. Also, Savile yeah. Sav- Sav- was the first host of uh, the original Top of the Pops, which took place in an abandoned church in Dickinson Road in Manchester too as well. Which is very, I find very interesting. Also, before it moved to London, and um, today, or well, in general, what would the socio-economic condition? Or would it be mostly working-class people? Would it be a lot of council estates, that kind of thing, or would it be a, a big mixture? Um, it would have been um, working-class people and council estates, as it is now. Um, a lot of the Manchester slums were demolished in 1963, I think it was, and then they all got shipped out to Hattersley, which is where I live now. Um, and that's where uh, Hindley's grandmother lived. And that's why they found themselves up here, because it was out of the way and it was remote. And um, you went from living in a, a house that was freezing cold with icicles on the inside of the window to having a house up here that had heating and all mod cons of the time. Yeah, the same situation happened in Ireland, in Dublin, where I grew up. I, I was a little boy and I can remember being moved literally from slums out to like in central heated apartments out, you know, further out. And it was even as a little baby, a little, very young kid, it was a tremendous contrast to see that. Yeah. And also, and this is probably a factor too, Sarah, and many of those people that moved from the city would have been generations that only knew urban existence. And then suddenly, and this was common in Dublin, I can remember very clearly, people were often frightened when they moved into these new estates out in the, out in the, out in the sticks because back, back behind your backyard, you could have the wilderness the, in Dublin, the mountains, but in Europe, the moors. And that used to frighten. I can remember one of my aunts not wanting to move to a certain area because there were cows living in behind her back wall. And that was, I, I think that psychic shock had a lot to do with this kind of stuff as well. Yeah, a lot of people um, who are used to city living, they can't sleep in the countryside because it's too quiet. It yeah. keeps them awake. But it- um, but then I'm, I'm the opposite. I I grew up in the countryside. I can't do city living. It, it overwhelms me being in right. a city centre or um, a busy town. And the socioeconomic situation since then would have been like everywhere else, like working class people, not much, yeah. lots of bad unemployment. Would you have the same social issues, drugs, basically, yeah. and crime, deteriorating families? That- yeah, same as anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it's just an awful thing. I mean, it's it's so common, but it's like, you know, push them out into the, the wilderness and let them rot, basically. It, ha- it's a, it is a real housing policy in these islands, I think. But I think um, the kind of sadness and melancholy that's in, in these places, that's been um, kind of built up in these places over, over the years, um, it makes the town seem insignificant to those people that like to be drunk on power, you know, like your, your, your average psychopath. Yeah, so yeah. they're attracted to these places because they think that the people here, um, nobody's going to miss them if anything happens. They're, it's they're, an easy insignificant pick, place. they're easy pickings on the margin of society kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Now, before these suburbs were built, was there, you know, towns and villages there that had the same names, I guess? Did they have any um, kind of haunted, haunted, haunted histories or strange histories? Yes, we had lots of farms here um, before before the, the estate was built um, and lots of strange stories there. Um, lots of ghostly stories and strange goings on. Yeah, sorry. 
and uh, any place in particular, any farm, any um, stories of headless, headless horsemen and this kind of thing. I find that's a kind of concert one in these kind of places. Uh, yeah, we've got Godley, which is just um, a couple of minutes drive from here, which I did the video about the bar guest, about the, uh, the, the ghost dog. Right, 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 yeah. It was said to have come from a haunted farmhouse down there, I think in the 1800s, and that's supposed to still be roaming around now. I've never seen it. That's a very common English folklore yeah. archetype, the, 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 the scary strange dog it, yeah. and it's actually quite common around right as far as india it's in the europe but in england it seems to be particularly the hound of baskervilles being the most famous fictionalized ones you had the black shook mad giant dog that lived in england and this story of the black of the, the the dog in england is a very common one there's also a, a that may have come from the vikings or the anglo-saxons because they have a, a legend of a dog that begins with the letter g I can't pronounce it, but that's a fascinating thing. A lot of the witchcraft stories in that part of England often involve the manifestation of the devil in the form of a dog. Was there any yes. witch? Was there any witch trials or anything like that in that area that you're aware of? I'm not aware of it, but there's lots of stories about um, um, sacrifice, and um, I mean, one story I'm not too comfortable with because I, I don't believe um, is that the Druids did human sacrifice up here. I don't believe that. I that's, believe yeah, we, were, we were invaded by the Romans up here. Yeah, and I yeah. believe that it was um, a story of the from the Romans that to make us look like savages and, and barbaric. So I'm yeah. not having that the Druids did human sacrifice. No, that's all. That blood libel thing is always applied to like uh, marginalised or immigrant groups everywhere. And it's that's one of the reasons I don't believe it because everyone's been accused of it. Everyone, and yeah. um, it's a handy way of saying, "Oh, these people deserve to be destroyed because they're 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 savages. They 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 drink the blood of children and stuff like that." Yeah. But yeah. What about megaliths? Is there any ancient sites like uh, stones, uh, standing stones, or anything like that in the area? Um, I'm off as soon as this cold has gone. I'm off up and about in the hills. Um, we've got something called Robin Hood's Pickering Stone, which is um, supposed to be a druid um, sacrificial table Beautiful type thing. Story, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't believe that. I'm going to do a video about it. I, I, I don't believe that, um, but it's there. And I'm going to go up and, and have a look. Um, I've not I, I've not come across. Any any major megaliths up here? Not that I'm aware of, but I'll, I'm keep looking. Yeah, a lot could have been destroyed in the Industrial Revolution. A lot could have been done. A lot of them could have been and also the Puritans destroyed a lot in that part of England as well, because they saw they were devil stones. And anyway, it could have been a, de a Druid sacrifice altar because the, the the megaliths are from thousands of years before the Druid. The Druids they they came much later, and they weren't a stone culture. They they were a woodland culture. Yeah, so. Let's talk about specific legends uh, that you could elaborate on, things that you find tremendously interesting. Give us a, okay. few, talk a few examples. Yeah, well, I've brought a few here, actually, because um, I didn't want to miss anything out of them. So if you just bear with me. I've sure. got um, I've got my favourite, which is the Longendale Lights. And I've got one which involves um, a pub just across the road. And the Devil's Elbow, which is the uh, a very strange bend in Woodhead Pass, where a very large Lovecraftian slug was seen going across the road. Uh, any yeah. more? Any more? When was this? Any more info on that or anything? Oh, this it, it was a long time ago. It was a legend about a father who forbade his daughter to marry, um, and swore that he'd rather the devil took her than she get involved with this fella. Anyway, she went and met him anyway, and um, uh, they, they met the wrath of Satan, um, who caught them meeting in this place in the hills. So, um, yeah, apparently the devil wasn't very happy about it because her father had done a deal with him because he didn't want to see this man. And um, it was on an area where there's a hairpin bend in the road. And... Uh, and the legend now goes that there's there's a slug or a, a large um, black insectoid that's seen going across. 
And this has been reported until recently? Uh, no, this is it's quite old. This is like we're talking like 1800s. 1800s. It's quite an old story. I mean, again, it, 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 it could be legend, but I believe that all the legends, there's some truth in there somewhere. What, what town is that? That is Woodhead Pass. That is just at the bottom of Bleak Low Moor, where I went up to film the aircraft right. crash. Yeah, that's an interesting one, that film. If you check out Sarah's channel, I'll put a link below. She went to visit a an American bomber, was it, that crashed? Yeah, and that's it's, it's in remarkably good condition. That's what was weird about it. There was like, oh, you, you think it only crashed last year or something, and this was back in World War II. And was there, I could imagine, is there any, any what about stories of ghosts of airmen and stuff like that? Yeah, there's um, a lot of people have reported that they saw the captain wandering around uh, Landon P. Tanner. He's said to be up there, just look, walking around. Um, it's very, very sad when you get up there. The atmosphere changes. Um, you, you can almost feel the, the spirits of those 13 people that lost their lives in that air crash. It's very sad. And the fact that everything is so well preserved. I know. I was surprised when you when you you were outlining the story and then you went to your camera, you and your husband, I think I guess it was filmed the site. I couldn't believe the instrument panels and everything were still in excellent condition. You That's know, right. you, you feel like the plane could be picked up, put together with a screwdriver and flown away. Yeah. It's almost like uh, the, the landscape has deliberately preserved it or something. Yeah, it's kind of like a psychic freeze. Yeah, a mum like it mummified the, the, the crashed aircraft almost yeah. at the yeah. moment. Yeah, a psychic freeze. I was I was quite taken aback by that. Yeah. How was um, it about one? It was very sad up there. It was very sad. Um it, it, it made you cry. You actually felt it. You felt this sadness and um you got well, I myself have got pictures going through my head of um, the last day of this captain. You know, he uh, woke up for his breakfast and um, it was just a routine flight. And let's get it over and done with so I can get back to my wife and, and children. Um, they were due to fly back to the US not long after because the war had finished. I mean, the guy survived the war and then um, on a routine flight from RAF Scampton, to RAF Burtonwood in Warrington. He came to a sticky end over a bleak, ghostly place like that. And to think that he's, you know, he, his spirit might be trapped there. Yeah, and in, forever trying to get home to his family in America. It's a terribly, I'm sure there's millions of stories like that. Yeah. So I've, I've had this, I have a, I have a German friend in from Hamburg. And he's open-minded, but he said, like, he says, Hamburg was so badly destroyed in the war. Where are all the ghosts? And my theory is that it was all rebuilt. It was, you know, that's why there's no ghosts in these places like Berlin and Dresden. It was rebuilt. And it, if you have cities that, that where, where you have streets which survived at the bombings, and the, they, they do have those energies in them. Absolutely, they do. And that may be why that area has that energy, that psychic sort of haunted feeling. It's because the aircraft is still there. It hasn't been dug up. It hasn't been removed. It hasn't been taken away. It's almost like there's a psychic imprint in the stones, perhaps even the quartz, that actually almost plays back like a tape, like they call it psychology, yeah. that plays back to anyone who's sensitive to it. I, I absolutely believe that stuff. I've had those experiences myself. Um, I mean, I, I went up there for a look and I wasn't expecting those feelings to be as strong as they were. It, it made, you had to sit down and um, you sat there upset over something that happened all those years ago that is no connection to you whatsoever. And I was touching the aeroplane pieces and as I'm touching them, I'm getting flashes in my head of this guy's last day. And I really kind of connected with that guy while I was there. And so much so that I went and had a look at, looked him up on online and I found, um, I found out about him. You know, we had a wife and he had children and uh, he had a two year old daughter at the time he died and and unfortunately the daughter she she drowned in a canal when she was eight years old so six oh. years later the daughter died and it was just tragic it was just so sad back in america dealt with yeah yeah does that there's this there's this ability or this gift that we want to call that 
is that anyone else in your family have it like your mother or anyone like that? Uh, my grandmother, uh, my great, my grandmother's auntie did, sorry. And uh, my dad's very sensitive as well. So yeah, it's it's there. But um, it's it's not something that I go around saying, oh, I can do this and I can do that. I'm quite private about it, really, you know. And um, also a lot of people that genuinely have that gift kind of wish sometimes they didn't have it. Yeah. Because yeah. It's, it's not a pleasant, it can often be very unpleasant, like what happened to you up that day on the hill. Yeah. Had I known, I might have um, prepared myself a bit better, you know, put a bit of protection up or, or just gone up a bit, closed down. But it, I wasn't expecting, I wasn't expecting that. You, you, you have to see it to believe it. Yeah. Oh, when it comes, uh, yeah. I mean, people will see it after they see this video. It's, it is remarkable. Also, yeah. it's, just a, it's a, like a living, you can, see, you can feel the living energy of this ruin, of this wreckage. It's the strangest yeah. thing. And I think that's only because of the remoteness of the crash site. I mean, that is a bleak place. There's no lights there. There's no housing. There's nothing. So at night time, it's pitch black there. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't want to be there at the night time. There's nothing there. Nothing human, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any kind of legends regarding things like fairies and stuff like that, goblins or anything like that? Yeah, we've got some legends about the fairies up there, um, the Longendale lights, the strange lights in the sky. They're one one explanation for that is that they could be fairies um, or will o' the wisps. Um, we've also they also could be aerial phenomena, UFOs. Yeah. Um, some people say it's the devil. There's all kinds of um, explanations it's even been put down to it being the quartz in the area as well causing people to hallucinate uh well yeah and also you have plasma which can be released by these quark seams in these areas especially yeah. in areas that are like size and size of size is really active have you seen the lights have you seen i the haven't lights? no um, no i haven't seen them i wanted to i i've looked i've not i've not seen them so no, you, which is you, said, you said you grew up in the countryside, right? So you didn't grow up in these in this part of Manchester, this part, this area now. So yes, you, I grew up in Hattersley, which is in the okay. countryside. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, did, did people when you were a kid talk yeah. about these stories, or did you sort of like just find out by accident? Like you know the way, like I I had my grandmother used to tell me all about like the, the fairies and the banshees where she grew up in, in a remote part of Ireland. Did you grow up in anything like that? Yeah, the local kids, we used to try and frighten each other with these stories. Um, As they do. Uh, yeah, there was always a white lady story, um, a haunted house here. And, and, and yeah, some of the legends from the book. There's a, the legends of Longendale by Thomas Middleton. All the legends of our area are in that book. Um, that book's in the public domain, so anybody can, can go and download that. And in fact, I've put a link to it on the video. Um, about the uh, spirit dog yeah. on YouTube. So it's there. Download it and have a read. It's fascinating. Has anybody, I don't know if you know anything about uh, dowsing and ley, yes. lines, ley lines and all this thing. Any information on that in that in the area? I, I've looked um, and I can't find anything significant about ley lines in the area. I, I've been out dowsing myself. Okay. Um, Tell us about that. I'm fascinated by dowsing. I just go around go around areas with my pendulum um, to see if there's anything going on there. Um, if, if I'm a bit unsure of a place, then I'll, I will use a pendulum. I, I've been down um, the street where the Moors murderers lived with my pendulum, and it, it does swing. I, I, like, like when you say just swings, it lets her it, it, away? Crazy, like very fast, you know, and you come away from there and, it, and it's not doing anything. Wow. And do you think this could be, I'm not saying anything weird, well, it could be a good thing, actually, that it's, that's travelling, that's, that's you that's making it swing. I mean, it by your, your, your nervous system being aware of it, what it, the thing it could is. Be. Um, it could be. But then yeah. again, it's still a valid thing if that's true, because you, you even though you know the legend, is the house that they lived in still standing or was it knocked down? No, they had to knock it down. Um, 
because it was um, a Belisha beacon for every Satanist in the area to come oh, and really? steal a brick. Yeah. Um, so they got rid of it. They got rid of it. And nobody wanted to live in it. And um, the the neighbours on either side were saying that there was strange, strange things going on. Um, they could hear uh, ghostly wailings what, in the what, house. Was, was this the house they would have tortured the kids in? Yes. Yeah. They could hear strange noises and and um, something about black marks appearing on the wall and then disappearing. This was in the neighbours' houses, either side. Yeah, so eventually they knocked it down. The and council and, came and they knocked it down. And, and that stopped. Now, that's kind of gives a rasty to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, that it's actually in the fabric of the structure. Yeah. And as long as the structure remains, not it doesn't have to be intact, once it's, it's, its materials are still there, that this goes on forever until the house is moved or something like that. Uh, that symbol of the, the the dark shadows on the wall, that's often demonic in a, a demonic presence. You know, when you say every all these Satanists and all these oddballs were going to collect the bricks. Well, now there you go. They were looking for the charge that was in the walls. You know, yeah. you know, this is like that 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 you know, that basically proves what we're talking about. That there is something in there. I mean, I've had these experiences myself. Now, with this, the house now gone, the, I can't believe they actually usually knock down those houses right away. After, you know, at the Shipman House in Cromwell Street, wherever that was in England, they knock that he- not Shipman House there. Um, is that the West? The West, the yeah. West yeah. yeah. They usually, and in America, they normally they usually knock down the house. That's the end of it. So I'm surprised. It's almost weird how they left that one standing. It was almost like deliberate, wasn't it? It's a strange one how they left that thing. And was it, it must have been standing for years, was it? Like afterwards? I think they, they knocked it down. I think it was 1987. I need to check that, but I think it was 1987 when they went back up on the moor, the police, and they found two of the bodies. But I need to check that. I'll check that for you. Uh, but you, nobody lived in it. Have you ever seen that article I wrote years ago saying that Jimmy Savile modelled his image on Moira Hindley? Yeah, and I had an interesting theory about that. Go for it. We can go for it. Um. If he ran the dance halls in that area and uh, Brady was, you know, he thought he was a bit of a cool cat and he was one of the faces around there. You know, he thought he was, everybody respected him in his own warped mind. He would have gone round to those dance places, those dance halls. And I think he met up with Jimmy Savile. Um, and I think those kinds of people, they kind of know they probably groomed each other in a manner of speaking. So you've seen how much they could say just to see how far. And then, and then, you know, you get the green light and you think, Oh, this person, this person's just like me. Um, and I think they got talking and I think he, they, they must've been to, into esoteric stuff. There must've been all kinds of things going on. And I think that Savile thought that, that Hindley was some kind of a priestess and that's why he emulated her. Well, there was something of the, the, that photograph of her and any photograph that I've seen of her, the absolute intensity of her face. Uh, it, I've, I don't think I've ever seen anyone like that. She has this this face that's almost not human. It's yeah. so unbelievably intense. And that famous police shot photograph, that's not the only one. Any picture of her, even when she was younger, she looks like that. And she came from a horrific family background of like sexual abuse, violence and alcoholism. I mean, she was literally raised in a kind of a, the worst home imaginable. And it was almost like that cultivated a demon inside her. Because in many ways, she, you know, she was worse than than Brady because she was actually getting the kids and bringing them over. I mean, mm-hmm. you, had, you had this nonsense about, oh, she was a woman. A woman wouldn't do that to children. Sorry, folks. Uh, you know, women can be very evil as well. That, that, that works both ways. And... Um, and then there's the interesting thing about Brady as a fascinating character. Um, he came from, well, this is the story behind him is that he, he came from a very impoverished part of Glasgow. Yeah. And he so moved the Gorbals. Where was yeah. it? What was the name of the estate? Gorbals. 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 The Gorbals. The Gorbals. Yeah. It's, a, it's, yeah. a big, it's a big town. It's, a, it's, like a, it's like Salford to Manchester. It's a big like area. And very impoverished. But it was all, there was always rumours that he was the son of an aristocrat. He was the bastard son of an aristocrat. And 
he um when he was in court and I, I know someone who actually was in court with him when he was on one of his kind of parole hearings said that he had this arrogance of an aristocrat that like the likes of Prince Philip or Prince or King Charles has. It's like, oh dear, oh dear, how dare you? And this is a guy who came from the absolute lowest end of society. Okay, another thing regarding Brady is that although he came from an impoverished background, he was incredibly well educated. He was the most dangerous type of psychopath in that he was extremely well educated and well read. And most of this happened while he read books while he was in prison. And these books were quite advanced for any working class person. And uh, he, I mean, we're talking about high end literature. He was literally reading Pru Marcel Proust and stuff like that. His mother said he could quote voluminous sections of actual books he read and knew everything about, you know, all the great writers. Now, while we were together in Preston, I don't know if it's you, but some person, a woman, forgive me if I can't remember your name, gave me this book. Okay. And it's called The Secret of the Moors, The Secret Key to the Moors Murderers. And it's all about the part of the world you're talking about, written by Erica Gregory. This book is the maddest, strangest, most out there, but at the same time, most unbelievably, and I can't believe it, plausible book I've ever read in terms of a connection it makes that Ian Brady emulates the life of a character in a James Joyce novel called Ulysses. And he deliberately went about his life as this character emulating the James Joyce novel in terms of his killing people. And they cover areas all around where you were talking about Lion Rock. I don't know if you know about that, up there in the moors and all kinds of places where he and Moira Henley had an obsession with details. Um, going up into the hills, showing maps of where to bury the bodies, where they were, and this kind of thing. And it's, you know, it's an incredibly out there theory. And thank you, whoever gave it to me. And I've been literally reading this book with my jaw open because half of it is I can't believe the audacity of it, of the theory, but also half makes me be like, you know, this is actually making sense. And I want to know why you think Brady ended up in that area. Do you think there's an actual, an actual reason why he ended up there? Well, is it that adage, it's very possible. an evil place attracts an evil man? Or is that too? Do you, do you mean, um, as, did, he, did he have a connection here or did he hear about some, some kind of networking here? Two, well, there's two answers that you can really go for. Was there something in the area that psychically, paranormally, mm. mystically drew him? and Or else, was there a secret network? Of I think it's a bit of both. Dark. Oh, wait, can you ex extrapolate on that a little bit, Sarah? Well, I mean, he's obviously into esoteric stuff and the occult and knew way more about it than your average Joe. Um. So if, if there are, if there are um, psychic hotspots and ley lines here and it attracts people, he's going to know where, where to go to prey on people. Um, and yes, I believe that there was a network of people here and I believe that, um, that, that, that Jamie Savile was part of, of that networking. Where was Savile originally from? Was he from the Leeds area? Leeds, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. We certainly lived there. Um, yeah. It was up that way. Yeah. Was there, were there any connections around there to uh, Sutcliffe? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Just yeah. that, I, I mean, I was only a little girl then, but I do know that a lot of men around here got called in for a, a, a line-up and for questioning. But that could have been all over the all over the country. Um, yeah. I was reading that. Uh, I, I do believe that Brady was this the, son, the child of an aristocrat. I've no doubt about that. The bastard son of an aristocrat. And I also believe that 
you know, his, his intellect, you know, it could seem like, well, how dare you say working class people can't be that intelligent. And, and that, 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 I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying it's, it's, he, has the, he had this emulation nature of him. And this seems to be common in these kinds of people. He, he, he actually learned the Swiss dialect of Germany, German, so he could understand what the mind of uh, Joseph Mengele was like. I mean, that's a way of thinking that's far beyond what any of us are like. And you also have the thing of Jimmy Savile saying, I am the Marta Hindley story to Louis Ter Louis yeah. Yeah. I yeah. am the Marta Hindley story. So it, it, it would just, I know you have to live there and you're in this part of the world. You, I know you can't say that. But have you s s aware of evidence or individuals or things that have set off your alarms regarding that that some more veracity that it's like network idea um i've not come across anything personally it's more through through reading about it and watching watching films and, and listening to people like yourself your own research yeah. um but i was aware i mean from from when the jimmy savile story broke it did come out that he was a procurer of children in a network of paedophiles within the Manchester area. And um, it was through, I think it was through a record shop he, he managed or he owned. Yeah. It was something to do with music. Um, and they spoke in code. But yeah, I've, I've not come across anybody uh, or very anything. They very heavily connected the underworld and the mafia, the, the gangsters as right. well in Manchester, very heavily connected. And uh, that was what gave him a lot of protection, that this right. on the world connections. It, it, like the craze and, and... Yeah, well, no, well, the Manchester version that there were gangs. In fact, you remember, I don't know if you remember the band, uh, Thin Lizzy, the mother, yeah. the, mother uh, the mother ran a guest house in Manchester that was filled with all these guys. She was like a gangster's mall kind of thing. And that's never hardly ever talked about. Phil and his mother was uh, involved in all that Manchester gangster scene. But that's it was apparently a big thing in the day at the time. That would have been around the time of Savile as well. Well, it always has been. I mean, you look at the Hacienda and stuff like that in the 80s, and there always has been that, that crime world element in Manchester like, and like any other large city. But um, Although going back to what you've just said, we did, um, Stuart Hall came from Hyde. Who's Stuart Hall? He was the presenter from that awful programme, It's a Knockout. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the Olympics for, like, idiots, yeah. yeah that's right, well, he was from Hyde. And he was done for, like, messing with loads of little girls, wasn't he, or something like that? Yeah, yeah. He was from there. so He was from Hyde, yeah. So he may have been part of that as well. Again, it just seems to be that the, these boiling cauldrons, cauldrons can create, the, create or draw these people in. And is there a high crime rate even today in these areas? Um, not not where I live. No, not really. No, not it's got a, a reputation, but no, it's it's quite a nice place to live. Really, very right. quiet. Um, it's just, um, it's just got this stigma with it now because of of what we've had. I mean, it, we were just recovering from the Moore's murderers stigma, and then along comes Shipman, and then that's it. Then that's that. Do you ever get the feeling, and I, I tell you, I, I lived for a while at my parents in a place called Tala in, in West Dublin, very similar, on the edge of the mountains. And there was all kinds of stories of houses having poltergeist activity that lived right on the edge of the areas. Then, then they found out there was megaliths were buried underneath them and everything. Funny story. Um, I grew up in a flat with a poltergeist when I was a child. Go on, tell us about that. Where was this now? Here in Hattersley. Right. Um under the part of the of the area um obviously I, I was I was only little about four years old to nine years old before we moved um I do remember it but I remember my parents explaining it away as something else so I wasn't really afraid at the time but looking back now when I think about what the you know pictures flying off the wall and um shadows walking past the windows and um, ornaments just literally not just falling off but flying off across the room that's quite it, 
quite scary and I still have nightmares about having to move back into that place. It's really strange. Yeah. I have a theory that these these hinterland suburbs and towns on the outside of big urban areas on the cusp of the country are rural areas. That is almost like the the darkness of the hills or the moors or the around them wash into these neighborhoods every so often in the same way the river brings that the rivers and the streams bring down water from them it brings down these dark psychic energies the kind of thing like when Lovecraft talks about the hills behind the hills above Ar Arkham or the, the hills above Dunwich or the the Sentinel Hill above Heath in Massachusetts this this dark foreboding energy weaves its way down into the communities every so often I, I bet that that vibe is huge there is it yeah, I would say I was I um I was listening a few years ago now. I was waiting for a bus and I was uh, over overheard a conversation with two women at the bus stop, and she was talking about something that some ghost in her house, some spirit that had tried to throw her down the stairs. Um, I, I, obviously I was just listening. I didn't get involved, but um, she was quite scared. Isn't that she remarkable was... when you when you enter into these areas? And it happens all over the world. And you suddenly feel this wall of dread hit you or this wall of melancholy or this wall of hauntology. It's, it's unless you've experienced it, it's, isn't it a very difficult thing to explain to people, I find? It's the yeah, sensation that a sensation literally hits you like a change, like a draft. Yeah. Well, like a psychic draft. Is a good yeah. The, the flat that I lived in when I was a little girl with the poltergeist, um, I know the man who lives in it now. Um, and I was talking, asking him, is everything all right in there? And he thought I was bonkers. He really thought I was mad. And he said, do you want to come in and have a look? And I would not, no, no, no way would I, I could not step foot in it. No, I, I wanted to, but I physically could not go in. I couldn't, it was almost like a ghost from the past, you know, I couldn't go in. Slug magic is getting slug totems is coming into my consciousness now. You just mentioned the slug thing. <laughs> Ten years ago, in somewhere in the south of England, in a very rural area, uh, I was doing a talk, and the person promoting the talk said, "You can stay in this house in the countryside overnight, and then next morning we'll collect you and bring it to the airport." And it's, it's a lovely old farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. And I went up to this house and it was your quintessential sort of like heart of England, red brick, pretty farmhouse. And it was in the middle of nowhere. And the entire walls of the place were covered in slug trails. Like there had been millions of slugs. And then I went inside and it was immediately like, I got to get the hell out of this place now. It's horrible. The energy. And the woman said to me, so do you want to stay? Are you going to stay here? And I said, no, take me to a hotel. I, I was like instantly like that. I don't want, yeah. want to be here. Take me to a hotel. I don't want to be here. Just get me to any hotel. I don't care how much it costs. I'll pay for it in my room myself. I don't want to be here. And she was quite taken back by, it was like, I, I was instantly declaring my intent that I was not going to spend another second in this building. And she was like shocked, literally shocked. I was picking up on something and I had something to do with the slug trails. Like the slug trails, the slugs were like encasing the house with like their slime. So whatever evil was inside, it wouldn't get out of the environment. I felt that way, you know, the kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I felt that way. And, um, Unless you're actually have, I mean, it's, 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 it's obviously a condition of our nervous system, whatever, that we have a different kind of nervous system or a more finely tuned or a, a differently tuned nervous system that, that you actually have these feelings. And you know yourself, Sarah, it's black and white. Yeah. I had a similar experience to you myself with the, um, I, it was 2014 and I'd gone to Wembley to see David Icke do a talk at Wembley Stadium. So I needed somewhere to stay the night before. So um, I picked this terrible flea-bitten bed and breakfast type place down there to stay in. 
And um, the minute I walked through the reception to check in, I didn't like it. I felt like something was watching and I was uncomfortable. I didn't like it. And everything went wrong. I tripped up. Um, I'd, I'd fall over. I'd bang my leg. Um, I couldn't sleep. Nothing went right. I was angry for some reason. I felt angry at, at, and there was nothing to be angry about. And, and then that night when I'd gone to bed, I woke up in the middle of the night and the wall where the bed was, was covered in um, like black liquid silverfish, but they weren't there. Mm. It was the strangest thing. And um, obviously I came round, I woke up and screamed and they disappeared. And the following morning, I couldn't wait to get out of there the following morning. Um, but, it, but it was just a terrible atmosphere. I had a row with the lady on reception. I don't know what about. It's not, that's not like me. Mm. I just felt like um, different, like something had attached and it was making me angry. I was, and everybody, everybody was pissing me off for no reason and they hadn't done anything. And um, it, it, it's, it went away when I left the building. It was horrible. Now, I've had um, those experiences in landscapes as well. Have you had those? You have to a certain, like going through the moors or something, you'd enter a certain area and you'd have the same experience. I've got to get the hell out of here, ASP. And I'm sure that's happened a lot of that to you, that way to you. Some areas in Manchester city centre, I don't feel comfortable going down at all. And that is um, Oxford Road, Oxford Street and um, Deansgate Locks where the canals are. I can't go near the canals. Well, that's where all the pusher stuff happened. You've seen my film on that, and that, yeah. I know that I, 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 you know, explored that area at like five in the morning just to see at the height of the pusher thing. And there was, I, you know, I mean, there's weirdos at every large city, but my God, there was some really strange weirdos around. And you, the the, the canals almost seemed like um, electric connect, uh, cables connecting all these types together like they follow the canals and someone told me that a lot of these and again if you live in a canal boat i'm not saying it's true um, but i've heard like stories that these canal communities are often not very pleasant communities to be a part of there's a lot of like margin these people live on canal boats there's not there's a lot of dark people in those canals as well they're kind of outside the system so and it's it's, it's a way of kind of like hiding and moving around without actually being seen things like that mm -hmm. that always made me, the pusher thing yeah i mean and then you had the, the prime suspect of the pusher is that that student that guy i think he was from over from indonesia who it has to be him i mean they found but even behind his window one of the bodies was found uh but they, they the manchester police played that whole thing down though it's not true it's not true but that's what they're like but the manchester police do that a lot they played the whole thing down with harold shipman incredible isn't the, it the local undertaker and a doctor from another practice said there's something seriously wrong here because the amount of old women that are dying in this man's care, will you please investigate? Even the coroner said there's something wrong. And they said, oh, you need to be careful what you're saying. You can't say things like that. He's a respectable man. And that makes me think, um, was he... Was he protected? Was he a member, you know, in the local Masonic Hall? Because the police, you know, the police sergeants and detectives, they, they, they look out for each other, don't they? Because they've got, yeah, they they've got dirt on each other. Yeah, they do up to a point. But if you find that he's killed like 300 women, was most the most prolific serial killer in, the, killer in the history of the world. Uh, yeah, and it, then it makes the police look like they don't know what they're out. doing. It's in, yeah, I mean... Did, did Shipman ever give any rationale to say why he administered all these, like these, these, these killing drugs to women? No, he wouldn't say. Uh, he didn't say, and he, he took it to the grave with him. Um, people have have come to some conclusions. I, I don't know how how true they are, but his mother died. Um, she, I think, she had some kind of cancer, and she would have a daily morphine injection. And she would, the doctor would give it to her and then she'd wait for him to come home from school. And one day he came home and, and she died. And some of the um, people who study this type of thing were saying that he might have been reconstructing his mother's death. Well, that's kind of interesting because didn't all the old ladies that he murdered loved them? 
Yeah, he That's murdered cool. one of my old school teachers. I mean, you shouldn't laugh, but uh, uh, <laughs> all, 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 all the women he murdered before they killed them, they would all be like, oh, he's a wonderful man. He's the yeah. best doctor in, in the whole world. He's a sweet. I'll go in, yeah. Yeah. I'll go in for the, low, the regular B12 injection and then getting a shot of morphine. And, and then what he was doing then was going back to the surgery and altering the medical records from years back to say that they had heart problems or they had drug issues. To, to cover up what he was doing. But some people have said that he was em he was reconstructing his mother's death or because he lost his mother at a young age, then, we, you know, you shouldn't have yours, so I'm going to see her off. So you or know how like it feels. Like murdering these women back for a bit to murder, mass murder to bring his own mother back into existence. Yeah, that was one, one um, or, explanation. Or maybe he wasn't there when his mother died, but he's there when these mothers died. Yeah, I yeah. Think. Either way, it's it's an unbelievable story. It's almost hard to believe. Yeah. But that, that, and that, and how close it, how close was that location to Marta Hindley and the Moore's Mortars house? Uh, about 10 minutes down the road, because that was in Hyde Centre, and that's our town centre because we're we're kind of out in the suburbs here. So it's about a 10-minute drive. So have you noticed anything between those two locations psychically? Is it a dark vibe in between them or something? <laughs> the funny thing is, Harold Shipman's surgery is now a vegan restaurant. It's now a restaurant. Yes, yeah, a vegan Indian restaurant now. <laughs> Have you been to it? I've been to it, yeah. It's very nice. The, so, the thing okay. is, when I went to it, um, it wasn't in my mind, it wasn't until I was in there that I thought, bloody hell, do you know where we are? <laughs> They kind of put me off my dinner, but um, yeah, it's a vegetarian, vegan restaurant there now. How weird! Sri Lankan, it is. It's a Sri Lankan place. And and and, and, and the area be connecting it between, say, the, the network of streets. Is there any kind of psychic strangeness in them that you feel, or anything like that? No, we've got a, a, a Masonic lodge in between there and um, oh, here. Ground zero. Ground zero. Um, Oakland's Masonic Lodge is there, which is just, it's, it's walking distance from here. Um, and it's walking distance to hide when you get there. And so, it's, still, it's still active and open. Yeah. And all the uh, the great and the good are all in there. As they I, say, I, you don't know. It's a big boys club, isn't it? And I'm not allowed in. So. <laughs> you do wonder, don't you? I mean... There always seems to be, I mean, I'm not, you know, not always, but the, there always seems to be a lodge that's within spitting distance spitting of many distance. of these no, no, nefarious happenstances. I've often noticed that. Yeah, there are always near police stations as well. Well, the two are very linked, isn't there? Black and white checkered thing of the police, the actual Masonic floor. They don't yeah. even, that's, that's not even hidden. And also the medical profession is very heavily Masonic as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not saying that these people that went there were in the high high ranks yeah. of of it, but they do kind of do each other favors and cover cover each other's backs and keep secrets, don't they? Oh, that's come out all over the world. There's nothing new about that. I mean, maybe they're not evil themselves, but they definitely have turned their blind eye to their the the the, the mother's sons, the widows, the the widow's sons, whatever whatever degree they are. It's a, it's 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 just incredible stuff. I'd I'd like to go there and visit there one day and actually make a film with if you could help me with that. I yeah. said I'd like to actually to visit those areas with you and your husband and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. In the future, I'd also you know as part of a follow up to the to the the pusher thing in the canals, I definitely want to revisit that story. And this gives me the impetus too. It's just that now I feel better talking to a local about it. And being this outsider coming in and feeling like I'm judging people, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be seeing that feel that way. But I'm delighted to. to uh, there was a place that I, I visited a few years ago in Maine, in the U.S. It was called uh, Booksport, and I don't know if you saw the film on this channel. But again, it's just a focal point of very strange things, and yet it didn't feel particularly weird until I spent more and more time in it. And there was a, there was one particular place there where this woman's leg 
appears on the tombstone of a man who was said to have murdered her. And it was there, I saw it with my own eyes, and no one can explain how this, this shape appears. Is there anything like that, like these kind of, you're talking about things in the wall, but these psychic imprints, is there any legends like that regarding sort of like um, a, a location where, you know, the, the church that you'd be whirling around the three times, the devil appears or anything like that. Is there any, is there any things like that? Because I absolutely love that. Oh, so. um, off the top of my head, I don't know, but I'm going to look into that for you. Yeah. I'm going to look into that. I will find something. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I find that stuff. It, it all ties in. And is there any w woods or old woods around there? Yeah, just across the road. I often go walking there with my dad. Um, we go down to the Etherow Valley, to the river. Um, and I believe this fairy is down there. It has that that feel to it. Yeah. yeah. Is there a, there's a stream? Oh, well, a river goes through it. So there river. You go. It's a river there. Yeah, big time. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, and uh, it, it's what's it's like it, it, trees like oaks and things like that and like proper old fashioned woods. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you can go down there and it feels lovely. Other days you can go down there and you think, mm, uh, I'm not wanted here today. So you, you come away. It can feel quite heavy. Have you ever experienced the ferry stray there where you've actually found yourself somewhere you weren't walking or hours passed and it only seemed like minutes? Has that ever happened to you there? Because that's happened to me. That's happened to me a few times. It actually happened on a YouTube video for me. This kind right. of yeah i mean you just like you suddenly i knew this woods inside out and suddenly i found myself in a part of the woods i just didn't know and i didn't I, and, I, and hundreds of times i've been there and it was right next to where i'd literally turned around and a different wood was behind me than all the hundreds of times i've been there and that's that's the fairy stray and it's that's happened to me a few times in that wood so you've ever right. had that experience like yeah so that's it's actually very disturbing it's actually because there's a sensation that you're not going to get out. It happened right. to me actually one night in those in that woods at the in darkness. I was stupidly went out at six o'clock without a flashlight, and by six thirty it was pitch black. And I literally thought I was never going to get out of those woods, even though it's not that big. It was a different dom domain or reality at night. So have you ever wanted? Have you ever had those experiences? I know you say you don't go to place at night. But have you been up in the moors at night or anything like that? No, no, I, I won't do. No, I mean, I've camp, I've been camping up in Scotland um, right. in the middle of nowhere um, and felt uncomfortable. But I don't know if that's my imagination or not. But um, no, I've never I've never gone walking in those kinds of places at night. Yeah. So not, I, no, you can find this. I've done, I mean, it would be safe. If, I wouldn't was, was tell a woman to do it, but not to be safe. There was a group of people, yeah. But I've done it myself. I've walked on the box here around here at night, and I can tell you it's actually a shamanic experience. You actually, right. your consciousness, it's, you don't have, it's like taking a psychedelics. You, you, your consciousness changes very rapidly. It's the sense of in danger that actually switches you out of the, the modern right. person, that kind of thing. And I, I would, you know, that's, that's, is there any kind of networks like that up where around you, like a paranormal group or anything like that, that, that is a, involved in that stuff up there like a psychical research group or something um there's paranormal groups up here but i'm not really a group kind of person right. um I, I've, I've tried things like that and it's not it's not me I, i'd rather you know either work with a close group of people that i know rather than a group of strangers because you don't know who's in there you, you know just like on the internet you get trolls and people who think they know more than you or that, that there's something wrong with you or you can send something they can't they don't like that yeah, yeah. you know no, so I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly what you mean a bit of this happened to me too as well yeah now we've spoken enough about the 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 hinterland of manchester and its weirdness you did a very interesting take on the elizabeth bathroy story the other night that and you covered it the how it really was should be covered that it's, it did she do it or not but I, I actually think that there could be something in that story beyond her just being persecuted for religious reasons or a land grab the, 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 how do you feel about that yeah there's got to be more to it but I tried to keep that film as balanced as I possibly could I didn't want to give my personal opinion in there you know because I mean 
I know as much about it as the next person. We don't know, but there's something. The, something, thing, that makes, the thing that makes me think there's something is that the, the way they didn't execute her, they locked her up. They basically got off on a cushy sentence, relatively. Mm-hmm. And just the, these people also write the history books. And they, like you said, like Shipman with the hospital record, with the, dent, with the clinic records, these are the ones who altered the records. And they could answer the records to say that the, the servants didn't say this or did say that. You know, the, the falsification has often been a way of gaslighting the population. We saw that with the whole thing with the lockdown and the rollness. Mm-hmm. And it's, oh, no, well, we didn't do anything wrong. And, and all I have to do is uh, fals- falsify documents and alter reality. And suddenly it didn't happen. And that's what was always the thing with the, the Elizabeth Bathroy, the, 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 the rationale that she was a victim of sectarianism kind of, and a land grab, does work. But at the same time, too, who writes the history to, to give us the story? I often wonder about that. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, because I remember, even though she was a Protestant, a, a Protestant in, in, in the Catholic empire, she was still related to a lot of those people that were on the other side. And they don't want the guilt by association, even, even, even if the family, she had been converted and so on. It, they, are, they don't want to be related to that. I think there's a big thing like that goes on. But that was a good film. What other what what other films, any ideas do you have for other films going forward? Um, I'm going to go up to Ludworth Moor very soon um, and do some filming up there uh, for Coombs Rocks, which is where the Romans invaded. And there's um, a good legend about that place, but it does involve the Druids. Okay. Um, and the human sacrifice, so um, which I think the the, the legend um, has its basis in not fact, but in this storytelling from the Romans. Yeah, and it also could be blood sacrifice, could be allegories or something like that, or it could be yeah. a way of hiding a mass murder or something like that. Yeah, but, I mean the story is a very interesting. It's a nice story. It's nice as as. There's a story about war can be, but I think it's very fabricated and very one-sided towards the Roman invasion because they annihilated the British army up here. Yeah, so well, I'm going to go to the spot. It's supposed yeah, well, to be haunted. That's what the Roman thing of conquest meant, the absolute re- removal of the previous culture completely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's what conquest meant. It didn't mean just taking over. It meant like literally replacing. And yeah. we're still going on with that stuff today. So, Sarah, before we go, we've nearly up out of time. Tell people, tell everybody where they can find you. And do you have any plans for writing a book or anything like that down the road? Um, there might be a book in me. Um, we'll see. Um, you can find me on YouTube. Um, if you just look for Sarah Mondaini, I'm going to do some more mystery and Fortean type videos there. Um, I'm also in the process of just recording some audio books, some stories. And I'm going to put those up eventually um, because I think for the last two and a half years, it's been quite a struggle for people to kind of fight this globalist takeover. It's quite stressful. Um, So I thought maybe I'd do some soft spoken books and stories and upload those with some ambient sounds so people can. And what kind of of stories would there be? They'd be your classic public domain stories, you know, you know, your old, old stories like that. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Well, I'm in the, I'm recording some at the moment and then I'm going to upload those, put those on there and put some ambient sounds to them. Um, I may may even put them on a podcast eventually for people that don't really want the sounds and the visuals. They just want to listen. I look forward to that. That sounds really good. Yeah, it's just to help people relax a bit because, I mean, you you yourself, you've um, helped so many people get through the last couple of couple of years, myself included, and it's been quite stressful. And I do believe that a lot of people are suffering from a uh, form of PTSD at the moment with this si- well, intense I, I, psychological I know, I know, terror. I know I am. I know I am because I, 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 that was, I won't go into details, but the other day somebody talked about, mentioned something, and literally I had... It would felt like I got a punch in the stomach. I remember it's like mm-hmm. the, the Christmas 2020, how horrible and evil that felt. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, th- I mean, th- like I said, I help people. I was really trying to get myself through that as well. I was just like reaching out to the world. Am I going mad here? Am I alone? 
and thankfully I wasn't and there was lots of us yeah. and that was yeah. important for me too so like thanks to you you so people like yourself and others out there were out for me there as well because that meant yeah. a lot too because I wasn't alone but uh we've survived and we've made it through and we are I, I, I think you're the same as me I just want to be an archivist for the future from this point going on I want to tell stories that won't be forgotten in the future do you feel I bet you feel that way as well I do. And I think the um, the art of storytelling, it was lost. And I think it's coming back, like you said yourself, you know, and I think uh, in 100 years from now, the stories that will be being told will be about this period. And yeah. um, I don't want them those people in the future to just be telling stories about the globalists and, and, um, yes, and the exactly. NPPs. I want them to talk about the the people that were cancelled, the what you know, that's exactly how I it. And, and another, you know, with the dark, we're entering into it, we're, we're, they're telling us, by well, all means, we're having a dark winter ahead with the lights out and stuff. I've got myself a very powerful battery operated radio that takes uh, the USB cards and plays MP3s. And I'm going to have, if I'm stuck in the dark here with no lights, I'm going to listen to audio books and maybe even you get some of your own stories if you get them out just. We, there's an, I always believe that in the darkness, these things will shine. And a very way may well be the making of people like us by we're sort of like the druids of today. We're actually holding on to the culture of the past to try and bring it into the technocratic age. And we can't run away and become Luddites. So what we can do is co-opt their, their thing and their technology and, and put ourselves into it. That's how I feel about it anyway. Like we're kind of like, digital coldies or something you know we're, we're we're restoring the old world that's how I feel anyway I think um it doesn't matter how old you are I think there's something really soothing and comforting about having a story read to you yep definitely definitely so yeah I'm going to do a few of those and get those up alongside the 40 and so you'll have the 40 and to make yourself feel a bit uneasy with but then you'll have the books as well if you you want to relax Brilliant. So that's and I'm just going to keep putting content out there and see where it evolves, really. And listening to it by candlelight, it'll be very, very gothic, romantic, won't it? Like back to the old early, like the days yeah. of, of Charlotte Bronte and things like that. Well, yeah. I, that ain't so bad after all. So, well, thanks, Sarah, for everything you do. I'm really looking forward to seeing how your stuff develops in the future. It's already made a great start. And uh, I'll put the link down to the show. Thank and, you. Uh, or to your pro, to your channel and uh thanks very much for coming along and you know thank you for having me we need our storytellers and i'm glad people like you are here so good night everybody and we'll see you for another conversation soon bye bye <laughs>